this report will be provided uh, to the STB uh, hearing for a matter of the record. The Ashto Rail Bottom Line Report presented an early and creditable case for the proposition that adequate rail freight capacity is an essential element of the national freight transportation system. Importantly, the focus was not on the need to strengthen rail companies, but on the need to strengthen the freight system uh, in the context of an integrated multimodal freight transportation system. The purpose of the 2003 report uh, was to keep pace with the expected growth of the economy over the next 20 years. Uh, the conclusion uh, of the report, based on consensus forecasts, freight demands, and realistic estimates of investment from traditional sources, was that freight rail would be insufficient to maintain rail share of total freight movement and that the cost measured in terms of highway congestion, highway maintenance, construction, increased cost to shippers, and consumers would be large. They also concluded that relatively small investments in the nation rail system, we emphasize the word relatively, uh, can be leveraged to provide large, relatively large public benefits. These investments would fill the gap between what the rail industry could, uh, could be expected to generate from its own sources and what would be needed to make it possible for rail to continue to carry at least its current share of freight volume into the future. The report went on and noted that in the unlikely event that all traffic moving on freight rail were shifted to trucks tomorrow, it would add 92 billion truck vehicle miles of travel, resulting in the need for 64 billion for highway improvements over the next 20 years. That $64 billion number is a conservative number that does not include cost of improvements on bridges, interchanges, local roads, new roads, or system enhancements. Those numbers could double if you began to factor in such, such numbers into that equation. It also uh, uh, addressed uh, four other key areas, uh, economic development and productivity, international trade competitiveness, environmental health and safety, and emergency response. Uh, succinctly on economic development and productivity, uh, freight rail provides shippers with cost-effective transportation for heavy and bulky commodities, automobile transport, and intermodal, and can be a critical factor in retaining and attracting industries that are central to state, regional, and national economies. International trade competitiveness in partnership with the trucking industry provides intermodal transport, connecting seaports with inland producers and consumers, Freight rail also carries 16% of the nation's cross-border NAFTA trade. Intermodal freight rail service is crucial to the global competitiveness of U.S. industries. Environmental health and safety were fuel efficient and generates less air pollution per ton mile than trucking. Also, it's a preferred mode for hazardous material shipment because of its positive safety records. And in emergency response, it's vital to military mobilization as is demonstrated in war after war, including most recent mobilization for uh, Iraqi freedom and provides this critical transportation redundancy for national emergencies. It, must, it is important to keep in mind, however, the most important benefit by the freight rail system is freight transportation at large. The report went on to present a set of scenarios provided uh, estimates of the volume of freight that could be carried and the benefits and costs for different levels of investment, ranging from a no growth scenario to an aggressive growth scenario. You can see the full report for your, for your uh, information will provide the full details. Based on this report, AASHTO also developed and adopted a standing policy on freight rail investment principles and objectives that is also enclosed with our presentation materials. I, do, I really do commend Ashto because they do do some excellent documents and uh, they're readily available for people to use and use as references. Ashto policy stated basically, basically that without investment from outside the railroad, the rail system will accommodate some of the forecasted freight growth, but will relieve, will relieve little of the forecasted congestion on the highway system. Public participation in rail investment could produce a rail industry that provides cost-effective transport needed to serve national and global markets and relieve pressure on overburdened highways and support local social, economic, and environmental goals. Importantly, the policy suggests development of a 
public private strategy making increased levels of investment and realizing public benefits of a strong freight rail system at a national level and it will require a new partnership among the railroads the states and the federal government the partnership must enunciate a clear national policy of improving freight rail system productivity expanding state eligibility and flexibility to invest where freight rail improvements have significant highway and public benefits increasing loan and credit enhancement programs and initiating innovative tax expenditure financing programs including accelerated depreciation tax exempt bonding bond financing and tax credit bond financing the partnership must extend beyond state boundaries to match the scale of the policy and the investment decisions to the scale of today's freight rail system when the policy was adopted it was felt that the present need is to treat the key elements at the top of the system nationally significant corridor choke points intermodal terminals connectors urban rail interchanges etc investments at this level hold the most promise of attracting and retaining freight rail through improvements in service performance that remains the case today ashto is currently working and preparing its rail bottom line report too in a relatively short period of time between the two reports much has changed and much has remained the same however the conclusions in 2007 and those that are being reflected in the new report basically are the same as those drawn in 2003 freight transportation this is actually a quote from the book freight transportation is not keeping pace with demand and the economy it is shedding traffic to trucking and an already congested highway system this is happening despite the financial health of the railroad industry because the industry broadly is operating at capacity and is not investing as fast as the market is growing the worst this is worrisome because the freight system overall in the is in the early stages of a capacity crisis nationwide and if rail is unable to maintain its share of freight then consequences will be increased congestion on highways and a higher cost of doing business and a higher cost of living pressure on the system will increase because overall growth in freight demand driven by population economic growth and changing patterns of supply chain management uh, all exist moderate economic growth no more than three percent per year would produce a doubling of freight moved in the United States by 2035 at present there is no no plan for dealing with this growth in any of the freight modes the demand for freight rail service is actually projected to increase by 69 percent in tons and 84 percent in ton miles by 2035 by that time without investment in capacity expansion beyond what the railroads are capable of doing on their own from their own sources rail could see a decline in tonnage and ton miles one reason for the simple for the shrinking share of, of um, the shrinking share of traffic is simply structural change in the economy a higher percentage of the lighter less bulky high-value goods result in a mix of freight favorable to the trucking industry another reason is the pace of investment railroads like all private industry the report observes will continue to make capital decisions based on private financial returns and public benefits will just be an incidental part of the decision unless public capital plays a role adequate freight capacity is an essential element of the national freight transportation system but it is not the responsibility of the freight railroad companies to create and operate a successful national transportation system it is the responsibility of railroads to operate a successful business it is the responsibility of both sectors however to collaborate to achieve their separate and common objectives the issue for the public is not whether existing rail capacity is adequate to support profitable rail companies but whether it is adequate to meet the needs for a freight rail transportation system a system of rail infrastructure we have today is the same system basically we had in the beginning of the 20th century only smaller it is clear that the system is it is clear the system today is not the system that was planned and built in the 19th and 20th centuries since the passage of the staggers act the railroads have wrung everything out they can of the system in terms of volume productivity revenue 
while at the same time lowering average costs to shippers on a, an inflation-adjusted basis. It is past time to just be thinking about the 21st century. Recent projects, well known, some not, demonstrate efforts to retool for the future. Alameda Corridor and uh, uh, reiterations and future expansions of Alameda is one of the early examples. The Kansas, Kansas City flyovers were mentioned earlier today. Uh, the Shellpot Bridge was not, but was a project that enhanced rail service for the Port of Wilmington. The Heartland Corridor has been mentioned earlier today. The Fast Corridor in the Pacific Northwest involving uh, Seattle-Tacoma ports, making them more productive, efficient, and involving the movement of passengers, people, and freight. The Mid-Atlantic Rail Operations Study, which has received wide acclaim, including the infamous Baltimore Tunnels back in my hometown, uh, analyzed investments needed in the multi-state corridors from the New York border down to the North Carolina border, designed to dramatically improve corridor performance for both passenger, passenger and freight railroads as well. These are a few examples of the types of freight projects that assure a valuable element in a national system uh, would exist into the future. They're examples of successful uh, participation in public-private efforts to achieve both business and public policy objectives, and they include a variety of creative financing, financing approaches to date. And I emphasize to date because I know this is still an evolving discussion. Four key issues that warrant special attention to the context of this hearing are the role of the national rail corridors and the role of the short line and regional railroads, the achievement of public benefits, and the importance of passenger rail. A freight rail system that moved only freight from a point on the West Coast to a point on the East Coast would span the nation but would not be national. A national system is one that serves the needs of the nation, including locations and shippers that are necessarily a high priority in the profit paradigm of the Class I railroads. Given this view of the national short line and regional railroads are an essential element of the national system. Their role and significance in the national system should be recognized and their continued viability should be supported. On the subject of public benefit, the proposition that the national freight transportation system needs a freight rail element does not mean that any capital investment in freight rail just automatically produces a public benefit. ASHTO supports public incentives for private investment in freight rail if such incentives are created. However, their public benefit purposes should be well defined and there should be a process that makes it possible to measure the benefits and determine whether or not the objectives have been achieved. State involvement and support for state investment should accompany the investment incentives. From ASHTO's perspective, one of the important public benefit purposes for rail freight investment is expansion of inner city passenger services. This is essential to ensure personal mobility in many areas of the country. Everywhere passenger and freight share the same track, but it is outside of the Northeast Corridor that the track is owned by the freight railroads. I'm referring here basically to Amtrak. Public incentives for rail investment should specifically address projects that increase both passenger and rail capacity. ASHTO continues to be strongly interested in the expansion of rail capacity. In addition to the forth forthcoming report, the ASHTO Board of Directors has included transportation recommendations and a comprehensive set of recommendations to the National Surface Transportation Policy and Review Study Commission. Surface Transportation Policy Recommendations, National Service Transportation Policy Revenue Study Commission to March 2007. And we also have a copy of, of that for the record. ASHTO urged the Commission to support the establishment of the NAIL, excuse me, of the National Rail Transportation Policy. The recommendation declared that inner city passenger and freight rail are critical components of the nation's sur surface transportation system and went on to state that Current rail capacity is not sufficient to meet passenger or freight needs and called for a national rail policy that addresses, addresses institutional roles, passenger and freight capacity, and new non-highway trust fund funding and finance options. The policy must be developed in partnership with federal and state governments and the railroads. ASHTO pledges to work with the STB, the rail industry, and all those committed to eff effective and efficient and productive 21st century transportation systems to achieve all of these objectives. We wish to thank the board for the opportunity to present our views before you today.
Thank you, Mr. Ganoski. We'll now turn to Mr. Jeff Keever from the Virginia Port Authority. Welcome, Mr. Keever. Please proceed. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. I'm Jeff Keever with the Virginia Port Authority, and on behalf of the Port Authority, I'd like to uh, extend my appreciation for the opportunity to speak with you this morning, this afternoon, regarding rail capacity and infrastructure requirements from the port's perspective. It's been widely discussed today that rail freight is forecast to nearly double by 2020. And of course, the driving force behind this dramatic rise is the ever-growing international trade we enjoy with our foreign trading partners all over the world. I will Keeper, I'm sorry, if you just pull the mic a little closer, we're all struggling with myself included with the new mics, but sure. There we Thanks. go. Okay. I'll focus my remarks on the growth we see in the movement of containers. Um, in 2005, over 48 million TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units or 20-foot containers, were handled at North American ports. This is expected to grow to 130 million TEUs by 2020, just 13 years. The port industry is making plans to accommodate this growth at the waterfront by, by expanding our port capacity. Many ports throughout the nation on all coasts have major expansion plans currently underway or planned for the near-term future. As well, ship owners are, are producing larger and larger container ships increasing vessel capacity to accommodate this growth in international trade. Last year, the Emma Maersk, the largest container ship ever floated, uh, has a capacity of 13,000 TEUs, the largest container ship afloat. And of course, the Panama Canal uh, is passed a, res a referendum last year that will allow the canal to be expanded to accommodate the larger demand for these container ships. In our own port of Virginia, APM Maersk, the world's largest container carrier, will open a new terminal this July that will add over 2 million TEU of capacity to the Port of Virginia. We expect this capacity to be fully utilized in less than 10 years. And the Virginia Port Authority intends to open a new Craney Island Marine Terminal in 2017, only 13 years from now. Combined, these projects, along with improvements at our own existing facilities, <laughs> will more than triple our capacity in the Port of Virginia, giving us the capacity for 10 million TEUs at a port investment of $3.3 billion at the Port of Virginia. As our highways become more and more congested, we must improve our rail network and increase our rail infrastructure to move goods across the nation. Leadership from the federal level is required to leverage public-private partnerships to improve the freight rail net network and to benefit and for the benefit of consumers nationwide. No other project exemplifies the idea of public-private partnerships better than the Heartland Corridor. And you heard about that earlier today from uh, Mr. Mormon of Norfolk Southern. And I think, Mr. Chairman, in, in a previous life, you were instrumental in moving that uh, project forward, and we certainly do appreciate that. What it is is Norfolk Southern's shortest route from the Port of Virginia to Chicago is over an old coal route through West Virginia. Low tunnel clearances in the mountain prevents the use of double stack container trains over this route. The current alternative is a rail route through Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which adds 230 miles to the journey. Several years ago, Norfolk Southern began considering the potential for increasing the tunnel heights and improving the route for double stack container, container sta uh, trains. Early studies conducted by Marshall University demonstrated a positive benefit cost ratio for the consuming public. However, Capital cost and the benefits generated for the railroad did not make the project financially viable for Norfolk Southern. In addition, no single state along the route would consider improving the rail route to benefit the adjacent states. Safety Lou provided $140 million of the $309 million required to improve the rail route, clear the tunnels, build additional intermodal yards, and eliminate at-grade crossings in Portsmouth and Chesapeake, Virginia. With the seed money provided by Congress, Norfolk Southern, the state of Virginia, West Virginia, and Ohio have committed to closing the gap and funding the remaining $169 million. And I'm happy to report that this project is well underway and will be completed within the next two and a half to three years. The Heartland Corridor is a prime example of why public-private partnerships should be considered to improve the freight rail network. In this example, the low transportation costs will benefit the consumers in the Midwest, and the rail improvements are mostly in the Mid-Atlantic. The benefits to the railroad could not justify the capital expenditure by Norfolk Southern. The funding provided by Safety Lou as a project of national significance made this project possible, 
and the American consumer will benefit from lower transportation costs. A secondary benefit, of course, but very important from the Heartland Carter is the reduction of air emissions. Moving containers on rail instead of trucks reduces air emissions by 60 to 75 percent per ton mile. For every truck we remove from the highways, we, we reduce air emissions, and if we can find shorter rail routes, we further reduce the emissions. Clearly, the trend over the next 15 to 20 years for more containers to move through our ports. The port industry is making significant plans to accommodate this growth as well as the vessel <coughs> owners. We must improve, improve our rail network and increase our rail infrastructure to handle the growing demand from the containerized freight. Leadership at your federal level is required to leverage public-private partnerships. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Mr. Keever. Now we'll hear from Mr. Dan O'Neill. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. We're going to have a little slideshow here, um, which Scott Witt is uh, putting on. Uh, Scott is the uh, – what I'm going to talk about is the – I'm going to confine my remarks to uh, the uh, study that was done by the State of Washington on rail capacity. Uh, there are a lot of other things that have come up today that are, that are really interesting. That, uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill, if I could ask you to pull the mic real close. Okay. It's just, uh, thank you. Let's see. Maybe. Is that, how's that? Is that working okay? All right. So um, uh, my name is Dan O'Neill, and I'm from the Washington State Transportation Commission. Uh, is it too close or too far away? Too far away. It's, so. a, it's a directional mic, uh, Mr. O'Neill. If you, you speak directly into the line right there, it's going to pick right you up. There? Otherwise, it's not. How's that? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I can hear it too. Um, anyway, uh, we undertook this study, and uh, uh, Scott Witt, by the way, was the manager of the study, and he's uh, running the, uh, uh, the computer over there. He could probably do this speech, but I can't run the computer, so I'm, uh, I'm doing this. Anyway, how did the state get into this? Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the state of Washington has had for years kind of an ad hoc approach to uh, – various rail projects. Uh, it, ha it funds some short lines. It uh, has a rail passenger program, which it runs with the state of Oregon. Uh, it uh, owns some freight cars. It has some various other uh, freight projects that it's been involved in. So the key question from the state legislature was, well, uh, should we continue doing this? And if we uh, should, under what conditions should we do it? The state of Washington, uh, I don't know, we don't have a map up there, but there it is. Okay. The, uh, the state of Washington, just for your quick orientation, has a chain of mount mountains running right down the middle of the state, the Cascade Chain, which runs uh, all the way uh, into California. On the west side of the state uh, is the uh, I-5 corridor and uh, the BNSF uh, main line running north and south. We have uh, three routes across the mountains, uh, the uh, northern route, which uh, handles most of the double stack trains. Uh, the middle route, which uh, I think Matt Rose uh, mentioned, uh, uh, cannot handle double stack trains because of clearances uh, at the San Pedro Pass. And uh, the southern route, which is uh, along the Columbia River, BNSF on the north side of the river and the Union Pacific on the south side of the river. Uh, the findings uh, of the report are not very surprising. Uh, the major uh, eastbound container volumes uh, uh, from, the, uh, from Seattle and the, uh, and the Port of Tacoma are growing. Uh, the, uh, the mention here of the new ships, uh, these ships now can handle 20 or 30 train loads of containers. It's a huge amount of uh, traffic that was going to be uh, offloaded at these uh, ports. Uh, we have uh, large uh, grain movements going westbound. Uh, uh, most of that's along the Columbia River. Uh, competes with other uh, traffic going the other way. Uh, and, of course, these ports, all of them, the container ports, the uh, uh, green ports, whatever, they all need good rail service. Um, we have uh, carload shippers who, are, who have their own challenges, and, uh, 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 and then we have Class 1 railroads who are making their adjustments to uh, the world and uh, uh, coming along with longer trains and the hook-and-haul system. Uh, and uh, as has been said here many times, the railroad industry is not at this point uh, able to meet uh, the requirements of the, uh, uh, or meet the demands that are out there. Uh, we have some short lines in the state of Washington. We have, actually I was surprised to learn we have 27 of them. Uh, 
and uh, they touch a fair amount of traffic. The Union Pacific told us that across their system, 25% uh, 20, of their traffic actually is touched in some way by short lines. But many of the short lines in our state uh, are in, have financial difficulties. The state now owns uh, a couple of these. Uh, the agricultural sector of the state is uh, impacted uh, uh, substantially when, uh, when these short lines fail. Um, other findings, the state, uh, obviously, the uh, state uh, has we concluded, concluded that the state uh, rail system is nearing capacity in, in all the key corridors. Uh, the vitality of the state is dependent on a good rail system, and uh, uh, the rail industry privately financed capacity expansions are not, uh, are not enough. I should mention, by the way, that uh, our conclusions might look a lot like AASHTO because the, our consultant was uh, Cambridge Systematics, which uh, also did the AASHTO uh, study. But this was focused just on, on our state. Um, addressing, uh, just looking at rail capacity itself, though, uh, if you look at just the, uh, the narrow question of, uh, of rail, uh, the, of the railroads themselves, doesn't quite answer the question for the carload shippers because especially the small carload shippers uh, are finding that longer trains and uh, the hook and haul strategies are resulting in harder to obtain service, uh, more costly service, and lower quality service unless they have access to uh, some sort of transload uh, capacity, uh, capability. Turning to uh, rail passenger service, uh, inner city rail passenger service is uh, uh, really not growing in the state like uh, it has, uh, the state had hoped. Uh, poor reliability, we've heard about that today. Bottlenecks, uh, high freight volume on the same tracks, uh, low frequency, uh, all those things contribute to uh, uh, a stagnation of the growth. Um, and the, uh, the, the state has put, some law, has put some investments into this. Uh, I think we're at about $150 million. Uh, uh, the cost of running these trains is, uh, is high. Uh, the service problems are affecting ridership, and there's some question about how long we can continue to do this. Um, in conclusion, uh, the, the study uh, uh, did conclude that the state should continue to participate uh, uh, with other public entities and with the private entities in, in uh, helping to uh, improve rail performance or capacity. And uh, we need to look at uh, or keep open to unique uh, financing uh, approaches. Um, the, uh, uh, the first step we need to take, uh, we want the state to take, is uh, do systematic analysis uh, of public benefits, costs, and risks, uh, avoid the ad hoc approach that the state had been doing using in the past, uh, where the net benefits uh, uh, seem to be there and uh, they justify uh, public participation, uh, we thought the state should follow some general uh, principles. Uh, first, uh, encourage operational improvements so we don't have to spend a lot of money if we can uh, get capacity without it. Uh, preserve and encourage competition. Uh, target uh, actions to encourage uh, private investment and not just, I'm not just thinking here about the railroads, but other private investment. Uh, leverage state participation by obtaining, benef uh, benef be by obtaining from beneficiaries uh, their commitment and uh, the, perhaps their investment. And uh, we want to require that projects have a viable uh, business plan. Uh, a very important thing for this state was to have a central uh, uh, coordinated uh, director of uh, rail programs uh, because we just need a lot better coordination than, than we've had out there. And part of this is communication with the railroads. Scott Witt, who is uh, running the computer, uh, is our uh, new uh, uh, rail guy to uh, uh, coordinate everything. Um, we want to support uh, uh, a multi-state approach. We want to work with the, uh, the other states in the Pacific Northwest and, and on the West Coast. Uh, and we also want to participate in uh, the development of national policies. Uh, one reason I'm here, uh, because I, I noticed one thing, is a lot of these maps that we've seen show big, thick lines of traffic going along the southern part of the country and thin lines going across the northern part of the country. We want to make sure we're part of the, of the uh, game here. 
Uh, we have had past successes uh, with uh, uh, partnerships. I just want to mention a couple of them. One was, was mentioned earlier, the Fast Corridor Project, which uh, uh, involved several projects, actually about 15 of them uh, in the Everett, Seattle, uh, Tacoma area. We eliminated a lot of uh, uh, grade crossings. There are several more that need to be eliminated. But the, the critical thing here was the involvement of the state of Washington, uh, the counties that were uh, impacted, uh, some local cities, uh, local governments and cities, and the, uh, and the railroads. The railroads uh, put in private money as well. So it was a very, when you look at the list of participants in these projects, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and another recent uh, development is the uh, is RailX, uh, which uh, is in the eastern part of the state. This is operated by the, uh, the, the train is operated by the Union Pacific. But the interesting thing is that the project was developed by a third party, uh, the RailX organization, uh, that put together the, the, the plan, uh, made a private investment. Uh, we also put uh, state money and uh, uh, local money into it. The Port of Walla Walla, for example, put money in. And uh, it seems to be working very well. It's only been operating for about six or seven months, but it seems to be working. So uh, people are very happy. This is bringing... Uh, produce from all over the state into this particular area and running these 55-car uh, trains directly through into uh, New York. Uh, since the report, uh, the governor has proposed a container port initiative, and part of that includes uh, investment uh, in Stampede Pass, which is a rail facility, by the way, which, of course, uh, is owned by the BNSF. BNSF is putting in money as well. Uh, the governor has consolidated uh, uh, the freight and passenger rail matters into one place, which we thought was important. And legislation is moving, which adopts the, our report's uh, general principles and uh, is implementing a benefit-cost uh, approach, which uh, we think is very important. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. It's a particular pleasure to welcome back a distinguished former member of the ICC and the former senior staffer and counsel on the Senate Commerce Committee. Thank you for, as Teddy Roosevelt said, uh, for staying in the arena. <laughs> you're, you're in the arena and in several uh, capacities uh, yeah. on the commission, of course, and in the private sector as well. We appreciate that. I thought I'd retired, but I haven't, I guess. <laughs> um, Mr. Kiever, I was uh, uh, struck by uh, some familiar but some compelling numbers that you were uh, kind enough to share with us about the uh, national projected growth in uh, T TEUs, 20-foot um, equivalent units, if I followed your testimony um, correctly. Uh, that the nas national growth projection in TEUs is uh, from 48 million in 2005 to 130 million in, in 2020. 15 years, more than doubling, approaching a tripling. Uh, any rough breakdown nationwide, as far as you know, and how much of that should be expected to uh, uh, move by rail? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, while that growth is anticipated, uh, the preponderance of it, we hope, would be moved by rail. Um, the highway system is, was talked about earlier today. I don't think there's any way you're going to see another Eisenhower uh, program that is going to increase uh, highway capacity. Um, but I do think you'll see a shift in the dynamics of shipping as some of these larger port projects come online on the East Coast. Um, with the deeper water that we have on the East Coast and the preponderance of the population east of the Mississippi, the development of distribution centers um, in the mid-Atlantic area to feed that uh, consumer base uh, uh, east of the Mississippi. I think in the expansion of the Panama Canal, I think you'll see uh, a great deal of that Asian uh, trade shift uh, to the East Coast simply for capacity issues that the Vice Chairman talked about earlier with his concerns of Panama. Uh, we envision at all of our facilities that are under construction in Virginia that uh, we hope to move 40 to 50 percent of that uh, TEU capacity by rail. Um, this, these new projects have provided dual access at our facilities, and I believe that all of the port uh, development projects that are being constructed and being planned envision a significant proportion of it moving by rail. I'm glad to hear you mention the Panama Canal. I was going to ask about that. I've been struck sometimes in, in briefings with um, different policymakers, staffers on committees, and my travels in past jobs and this one, 
but there's, some, there's not always a full appreciation of just the staggering enormity of the number of the challenge. I mean, we are just such a large country, 300 plus million people consuming uh, more than ever, relying on transportation more than ever to, to get supplies and and uh, growing at three plus percent a year. And of course, there's no guarantee that's going to always be the case, but it's, it's been hovering around that level for some time. And no, no noticeable trends away from people buying consum consumables and uh, uh, add, you know, buying more as opposed to less, and uh, and having a demand for products from all over the world. Uh, the, the contrarians, I'll say, sometimes will will submit to me. Well, the growth can't continue. The port, you know, the big port of LA, Long Beach, will just kind of max out at some point. They've got their labor challenges. They've got some environmental challenges we've heard about today. And you know, we'll just we'll have to. It'll be we'll work around it, and and trade, you know, freight will just kind of. Flatten out at some point, and I. But talk to me about what you're you're in the business of planning for a very successful, fast-growing port. What are you projecting to happen on the East Coast uh, regarding uh, trade from Asia and elsewhere, and the impacts of the Panama Canal improvements that, that will come online? Well, I think with the uh, impact of these larger container ships that are currently under construction and moving into the trades, initially the larger vessels will uh, call on the West Asia West Coast trades. And then they will, the second tier vessels that are currently in that trade will shift to the East Coast. Um, and, and there are some services now that are coming from Asia through the Suez Canal to the East Coast. Um, it's a relatively short, uh, insignificant uh, mileage difference uh, for the, the, the two routes. Um, I believe that um, when the MERS facility opens uh, later this year, I think. Once they settle all the bugs out of that system, I think you'll see larger, some of their larger vessels deployed to the East Coast. And certainly when the Panama Canal is expanded, I think you'll see larger vessels coming from that Asia trade, all water to the East Coast, where they can deploy bigger, those bigger ships in ports that have adequate channel depth to accommodate that. Um, there are significant port projects being considered in North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, obviously Virginia. Uh, there are on-dock improvements that are being made at every other existing port. There are uh, new port facilities being uh, developed in, along the Gulf in Mobile and in um, um, the Houston area uh, to come through the Pan Panama Canal and make that stop right there at Houston and then serve you know, the, mid the Midwest and the, uh, the heartland of America, if you will, uh, just, just going north. Um, the growth that annually would just come to the ports of LA Long Beach is about the volume that we handled in the Port of Virginia last year. So just the normal growth that would come to a, the, the largest port in the United States uh, needs to have uh, additional capacity to go elsewhere. And I think on the West Coast you've seen uh, some of that volume move, but I believe that the all water service, certainly with the expansion of the uh, Panama Canal and the realization of what the Suez Canal can provide with East Coast ports, I think you'll see more of it shift into the east. Mr. Keeper, when you um, work with state and federal officials to talk about the importance of, of uh, meeting the investment challenges that the port needs in, in the railroad area in particular, I uh, imagine you do what we did when I was working with the, the port, uh, talk about the job creation benefits, the economic development, the, just the, the sheer economic importance of a, of a major international port to any state. But it's always a challenge, isn't it, to convince folks who don't necessarily live within 10 miles of the port or don't, don't have a relative that works there to understand that this is not just a local or regional challenge and to figure out how to fight for, for scarce uh, resources. Uh, talk about how, you, how you've been able to get – you talk about three-plus billion dollars of uh, investments. Uh, private investment, private investment. Um, it is uh, – it's an overwhelming uh, message to get across because so few people deal with our facilities directly, but every day they deal with a product that has come from overseas, just as this picture I noticed is made in Japan. I'm sure that came through a container. But um, we, we do make the case of the number of jobs, the taxes, uh, and the, um, um, the impact that the industry has on everyday, everyday lives and that the modest uh, cost of transportation to the delivered um, piece of uh, consumer goods is very, very insignificant um, in the scheme of things. I think in the, um, while Virginia is not the biggest port, and I was just talking about LA Long Beach, the economic impact of the port of LA Long Beach 
is greater than the impact of the Hollywood um, movie, and movie and television industry. But we don't get nearly the, the play uh, of that industry. It employs more people. It has a greater economic impact, but very few people are aware of that. In Virginia, it accounts for about 165,000 jobs uh, that are uh, port-related jobs, um, about a half a billion dollars in uh, state taxes, and, uh, and the payroll is somewhere about $4.2 billion uh, annually. So it's a significant impact, and you need to make that, uh, that statement. But the Port of Virginia nor the Port of L.A. Long Beach, and I'm not just picking on those two, they have a far greater impact across the nation. And I think the Heartland Carter was a project that we could easily articulate the impact that that project had on multiple states in getting consumer goods to the heartland of America and therefore, that uh, uh, tri-state uh, support was uh, very, very critical to the success of a project of that significance. Do you feel, Mr. Kiever, that all the players are appropriately at the table, kind of with their uh, proverbial poker chips, ready to participate in that in that investment game? To use a metaphor, I mean, in other words, you've got no shortage of of significant stakeholders who are uh, presumably making good money, coming or going from the port. But are they all there when the bill comes, needs to, in the time to have a bill paid for the infrastructure? I recognize no port wants to be the first one with a new creative idea that's going to look uh, unattractive to your shipping customers. But I mean, it's. Speaking only from the Port of Virginia, that I think <clears throat> the future looks extremely bright for. We've been able to um, have everyone at the table, uh, which is why I think we currently have a 50 foot channel and the ability to go to 50 feet. Uh, which is why we are have uh, why we have 3.3 billion dollars of uh, private or port authority money uh, investing in port improvements at Virginia. I will share with you that um, y'all were discussing about outside investment in the railroad uh, industry recently. The port industry has been the recipient of that as well. The Canadian Teachers Fund now owns a marine terminal and a marine terminal operating company up in the Northeast. Um, AIG, the insurance conglomerate, uh, owns a marine terminal operating company. We have seen an influx of outside investment uh, entities that has a huge amount of uh, liquidity and cash to invest in these properties. I believe they see this insatiable appetite that the American consumer has and the, the desire and the need for that to move through these sort of narrow funnels, if you will, at various ports. Um, but so far in Virginia, we've been very, very fortunate to get all of the interested parties at the table to work with us uh, so that we can push this over over the goal line. It's a, it was a monumental task on the Heartland Corridor. It's a monumental task to uh, get dredging through, but we've, we've tried to bring everyone there. I, I can't speak for other ports, and I certainly wouldn't want to share our secrets with them well, with respect to our success. <laughs> we won't tell. Thank you. Vice Chairman Buttry. Uh, is this largest vessel that you spoke about making a call at uh, the Port of Virginia anytime soon? Or? Uh, we, Mr. Vice Chairman, we understand that uh, MERSC will most likely bring that vessel for the opening and dedication of the new facility. It will not be in an East Coast uh, trade lane. Most likely it will be in the Asia-Europe um, trade lane because of the size of it. Um, but we can, in Virginia, accommodate that vessel and work that vessel in Virginia. It has a 46-foot draft? 46, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you want to go to 50? We are already at 50 <clears throat> with no bridge obstructions. We're at 50. We can go to 55 when the demand is there. Frankly, I think the, the uh, design depth of uh, container vessels uh, will probably not exceed what the Emma Maersk is. Uh, simply because ports uh, around the globe would would sort of max out, I think. Um, but we can accommodate that vessel in Virginia. I think it's just going to take a little more time uh, for the, uh, the, the, the the dynamics of shipping to, to change, as I referred to earlier. The Suez Canal has absolutely no uh, capacity constraints, and um, <clears throat> uh, eventually I think you will see a shift especially uh, as you look at India as a tremendous growing uh, opportunity for manufacturing and the shifting of manufacturing there. So you can make a call in Asia, hit the India subcontinent, and come up through the Suez to the East Coast. 
uh, could, is a very, very um, realistic possibility for East Coast ports. Much, much longer shipping time from India. Much shorter uh, shipping time from India. From India, yeah. but a transit from Hong Kong to the East Coast versus Hong Kong through the Panama Canal is only a 31-hour difference coming through the Suez. So that's really insignificant in the logistics chain of uh, moving the goods. Now you, you do your economic uh, forecast out to 2020, did you say? We actually have a 2040 plan at the Port of Virginia, which we update about every five years. And you said $3.3 billion over what period of time? Um, that would be the total build-out of Craney Island. The first phase of Craney would be opened in 2017, and that would be a $1.4 billion. So you, you, you'd knock off $800 million of that, and then the other phases would come in after that as demand is uh, required. So in, in the next 13 years, um, I'd say it's really $2.2 billion, and then the other uh, $800 million would come as demand uh, Dictates. Now, where exactly is that money coming from? Um, Three point, the two, you said 2.4. 2.5. 2. 2. The, Mer the MERS project is $600 million. That's private money coming from Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, that's a private marine terminal. We're spending about $450 million currently to improve our existing facilities, build a new berth um, at, at uh, North. State money. It's from terminal revenues. We terminal received revenues, okay. Fees. Yes, sir. Okay. And then if our projections hold true with respect to the volumes and the uh, revenue that we have enjoyed thus far, uh, we think if we can get the cost share agreement with the Corps of Engineers to conduct, construct the dikes and the levees at 50 percent or 30 percent, we think we can build the rest of the marine terminal at our own expense. So from terminal revenue is where that money would come. No, no federal the, dollars. The money from Denmark is private uh, funds. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. As would our money be because it would be generated from ship line revenues to our terminal operating company. And which uh, – you have, you have two rail lines shipping uh, coming into the port. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, North and Southern and CSX. Yes, Both sir. Both of them come in there. Yes, sir. Jointly served. And I concur with their uh, comments earlier that the relationship is very good and we all work well together. Good. Any other questions, Mr. Lutry? Commissioner Moley? Thank you. Sorry to Dan. Um, in Washington State, in, in the western side of Washington State, especially along the Puget Sound area, there's a lot of competition for a very, very heavily used and single line right of way. The line that uh, is used by Sound Transit, which Sound Transit wants to expand service, I guess, up to Everett, and uh, of course it's BNSF line, and yet it's right on the it's right on the uh, Puget Sound on the one side, and it's on a very unstable cliff on the other side. This strikes me as the kind of thing that uh, really cries out for some sort of public investment if, if, to, to expand that capacity, double-line that capacity. What is Washington State doing with the BNSF and with Sound Transit <coughs> to solve that real bottleneck and that real limitation on rail capacity? Well, the, uh, the Sound Transit... Uh the Sound Transit has worked out a good relationship with uh, the BNSF. I think they put $350 million into, uh, into that program. And so that commuter line uh, is, is working pretty well. In fact, there is service out of Everett uh, into Seattle. And, uh, of course, the Tacoma-Seattle route is, is working well. And I think people, uh, the chairman mentioned how he grew up riding trains. People in the West Coast, uh, they didn't grow up that way. And uh, it's kind of uh, amazing to us to uh, see so many people using this, this system, even though it's very limited right now. But uh, as far as what the state is doing, the state's uh, investment in that area has been limited to the Cascade, uh, Amp Amtrak Cascade line, which is a joint operation with the, uh, uh, with the state of Oregon, uh, which runs a line from uh, from Oregon up into uh, uh, Vancouver, BC, or near near Vancouver. Uh, so that's that's been the the, the focus at this point. Uh, I know that one thing that uh, you know, as you look at this and, and realize that uh, we have I five is a very congested highway. I mean, you know, you think I, I know I ninety five is congested, but. Uh, you know, we're not used to this sort of thing in the West Coast, and this is uh, uh, very troublesome. Uh, we can't build any more highways. I mean, uh, we're, uh, we have very limited uh, 
we're limited geographically by how how much uh, more we can uh, uh, how much more many how many more lanes we can build. Uh, so we we need to look at rail, and uh, uh, I think the future is going to determine how much money the state puts in there. We uh, I think they're going to try to take a we'll try to take a systematic look at it. The the amount of money that's gone in so far has already been uh, minimal. Uh, frankly, I think that we've got to look at having separate systems. Uh, the railroads, uh, the freight railroads, are getting crowded and uh, uh, at capacity, and uh, uh, commuter rail is, is is growing in that area. Uh, you know, there's, there's going to have to be another answer to this ultimately. Well, the Puget Sound, of course, is environmental, and what lands considerations make it very, very difficult to build out into the sound. Right. Clearly, if you're going to get the, the advantage, that seems to be the only uh, the only uh, real opportunity. Um, with regard to uh, Mr. Kiva and Virginia Port Authority, we we look and we said the American transportation system has sort of led the way in the world. We developed the railroads first, we developed the air system first, the Eisenhower Highway system. But all of these great improvements in technology and infrastructure uh, were really critical to establishing our predominance in in, in the world economy. I think and. So we look today at well, what's in the future, what future technologies are there. And if you look around, I, I suppose the only thing that uh, is really uh, truly groundbreaking or futuristic, even though it's been around for a while, is uh, this maglev maglev or magnetic levitation technology. Now, usually that's been talked about in, in, in the context of a high speed of the city service. But at Old Dominion University, they're examining a low speed maglev, which uh, could be used for moving containers out of the ports, out of the port cities into a uh, inland um, a yard area where they could then be loaded on trains, solving the, both the highway and, and rail congestion problems of the nation's force. Have you looked into that, or do you think that has any kind of uh, possibility for the near term? We, uh, we go by that every day. We go to our marine terminal, but unfortunately, they have not had any success with that project. The, the, the line, it goes over Hampton Boulevard, but uh, they haven't moved uh, they ha it hasn't been a successful uh, concept. We've been watching it from a, the sidelines, thinking that there could be some merit to it uh, with respect to uh, moving containers, mm -hmm. uh, but, but it just really has not gotten off the ground. We have a, an inland port <clears throat> about 220 miles up in the northern part of the Shenandoah Valley where we have take uh, containers directly off the vessel onto on-dock rail, and they go out um, uh, once a day to this facility and then from there they go to distribution centers in that area. Uh, so it never goes on a city street um, and it's going to an, an intermodal yard. Part of this Heartland Carter project includes three intermodal yards that will go directly from on dock rail um, to these places in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, Pritchard, West Virginia, and one that's already under construction in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and again, that's rail capacity that is being improved um, as we speak. Uh, Virginia is not putting any. Is Virginia putting any money into this research? I don't. Do you? Do you know? Or is yes, Virginia. Virginia has, and um, I, unfortunately, I just don't think the technology uh, is working. I mean, that's a that's a an issue for the uh, professors at ODU. <laughs> um, Mr. Ganaski, um the idea of public-private partnerships, of course, is always very attractive, and but getting the parties to agree on what the fair share is for each group uh, to identify who gets what benefits and who's going to pay for them is always controversial. Uh, in the CREATE project, which has been widely praised, there has been at least some dissension that, well, the, uh, the public sector is paying too much and the private sector is paying too little. And whether you agree with that or not is not what I'm asking, but rather how can we ensure that the benefits are accurately and adequately allocated to the various uh, parties should it be done outside? Should they negotiate it themselves, or should there be somebody outside who sort of monitors this and helps them to allocate the, the, the uh, responsibilities? We are uh, currently in, in relationship to the Baltimore region with the tunnel issues with Amtrak, CSX, Norfolk Southern, that, that whole region there. <clears throat> we had received an earmark in the last reauthorization also uh, to further evaluate those Baltimore tunnel issues. And we just had a meeting yesterday, as a matter of fact, at DOT to talk about exactly how we were going to scope that out and working with the Federal Railroad Administration and advancing that, advancing that ball, if you will. 
And part of it uh, is exactly what you have just said, who benefits, who pays, because that's always the big question. You know, everybody's got a great idea, but uh, when it comes time to reach into your wallet, everybody can let leaves the room. Um, so uh, that's the, the key in being able to do anything, is to get an understanding of that. Uh, we have some general assumptions that came out of some previous studies. I know that uh, one of the one of the railroads had mentioned that you know they they have a, a willingness to pay to the extent that the the amount they pay doesn't exceed their benefit, which is a pretty good way of looking at life. I mean, if I get a if I get a benefit here, I'm willing to to share that benefit back I'm in the form of of a toll or, or or some other mechanism. So we're in the early stages of maturing the next level of that because uh, when we look at something that's of the order of magnitude for uh, you know, what's the value of improving the Acela train's performance from New York to Washington, D.C., to two hours? Uh, how do you qualify, quantify that, and who's willing to pay for it? Uh, when you look at it, uh, having good links with your economic development offices, and you talk about the Port of Baltimore. We, we hear a lot about the Port of Norfolk. We love them. But we have a Port of Baltimore uh, that does not have 20-foot, 6-inch clearances. So now you look at all of our port jobs and all the things, and all part of a, a, a whole distribution system for the I-95 corridor. Uh, it's very, very complex, and that's exactly why we are now putting a uh, scope on the street to get some expert help to try to help us figure out how to wrestle that to the ground. Thank you. Yes, uh, everyone will always say that, well, the benefits really aren't all that great for me. They'll always try and understand what the benefits are to them, of course, and they'll try and net the most benefits uh, and then what they're going to pay for them. Um, yes, I, I, I would agree. It is, uh, it is a challenge, and, um, you know, I don't know of any um, – uh, casting concrete models that we could build off of. It's kind of like... It's, a, it's an issue that economists look at and try and find ways of understanding how people behave and, and um, what games they play, if you like. Right. Uh, we've talked a lot today about uh, making infrastructure improvements, which basically talk about in-the-ground capital investments, but mm -hmm. there's also uh, other technological improvements and um, other changes in shipper behavior mm -hmm. that could be accomplished which could bring about an increase in capacity or effective capacity. And, and perhaps cost less, perhaps cost less money, or at least require less investment by the railroads. Could you speak a little bit to that? Well, I know that um, um, there are some representatives here from National Industrial Transportation League, which are the true shippers' voice. So maybe they have some really great ideas on that. I don't want to, I don't, don't want to steal their thunder. Um, but in the time that I spent in my previous life on the marketing side of the railroad. I, I spent a little time working on the customer base, a uh, matter of fact, a lot of years. Um, there are certain things that the railroad does well. There are some other things that the railroads can do better. And a lot of that, what I can do better, depends on my infrastructure. Uh, for example, um, we had some experience where if you move, if you find an origin and a destination that that uh, a million tons moves between two points. And if you have the, if you're fortunate enough that both of those two points are served by a railroad, and if the railroad has capacity, and that would include the ability to justify investments in locomotives and cars, and if the railroad has the ability to dedicate crews, and if they have the willingness to turn them around on a 24-hour turnaround basis, there's a real win-win-win that comes right out of that process. It's something that I was a huge advocate of in my previous time. Um, I'll give you an example here that uh, in, the, in this area that, that goes unseen, and, and, and I know you're probably glad that it is unseen. Uh, it has to do with the way Norfolk Southern moves ad, uh, um, aggregates in uh, northern Virginia uh, to and from the district, rail trains that, that run repeated round trip daily trips. It has to do with how you move aggregates from uh, west of Harper's Ferry on the CSX railroad lines coming down into Bladensburg. Uh, you know, those two or three trains a day uh, are out of the eyes of the public, uh, but the railroads are quite happy to handle that business because the disciplines that I mentioned and the capacity are there to accommodate that and put some money on the bottom line for them. Uh, right here in this area, there's something that uh, CSX did years ago. It's referred to as the Montgomery County Trash Train. And it was a, you know, it's a win-win for the people that have to move trash and a win-win for the railroad. They, but it's got a good discipline again in, uh, you know, the invested asset versus the cost and repetitive cost of operating that asset. So anyway, I said all that to say this. I think that if the railroads have the ability and the origin destination pairs and the ability and the capacity to perform uh, at a competitive rate, competitive with highway, and they can put tight disciplines into high-speed turnaround trains making one, two, or even three round trips a day, 
um, there are opportunities. Uh, the, the TRB's good work they did with the uh, National Capital Planning Study uh, uh, or TRB Study uh, uh, 0842 is just recently being released. And it talks about a lot of the ways that, uh, you know, certain things can do well on the railroads. And it frankly talks about certain things that would not do well on the railroad. But it begins to set forth some of those parameters. But sooner or later, you come back to the revenue stream, the, benefit, the ability to utilize the asset, and the infrastructure to support the movement of that asset without displacing something else that you might otherwise prefer to handle. Thank you. I, I, I'd just like to comment on that. Uh, you know, the question is, what could shippers do? And, and one of the things they could do that we found uh, you know, is, is a real challenge for some of the uh, uh, small uh, car carload shippers is – uh, if you're running long trains and you're just and uh, the class ones want to do and you want to just hook and haul, um, uh, they want to, they want somebody to consolidate this traffic, and so transload facilities are probably you know a major answer to that uh, that dilemma. And the question we have at uh, state level is is this some some place where the state ought to put money? How sh should it assist these shippers in some way to? Uh, to put this together. On the other hand, the private sector has, has done it. Uh, we have uh, the uh, shuttle, uh, shuttle train running from Ritzville, uh, uh, Washington, around uh, down uh, along the Columbia. This is the BNSF train, uh, and uh, running on a you know, regular basis. Uh, uh, this is a fairly short haul, uh, and yet it is working very well. The railroad uh, is making money on it, and the shippers are very happy. So, you know, these, uh, I think these kinds of, of uh, uh, this, this focus on, you know, the railroad's going to run it this way. You might as well try to figure out how you're going to accommodate that, that situation. And some of it can be done privately, and some of it may need uh, public support. To make this a multimodal uh, hearing, to, uh, to some extent, uh, is there much grain or much traffic moving along the Columbia River now, and will that be affected by the proposals to eliminate some of the uh, the uh, dams along the Columbia River? Well, there's a lot of traffic still moving on the river, uh, you know, the grain traffic going down in barges. Uh, the railroads have taken you know, this, uh, this shuttle train, I think, has taken some back for the railroads. Uh, the UP is running a train out of uh, Canada down uh, uh, along the Columbia. So... Uh, Right now, I think the railroads may have taken some of it back, but it, yeah, there's still a lot of traffic on the. Uh, Will the change the in the dams affect the DNL? Well, they sure they have a tremendous effect. If they take those dams down, I think it, uh, you know, some of that will not be navigable. Right, that's what I was thinking. Right. So, can the railroads handle that uh, increase in traffic then? Because I understand. Well, uh, since, the so. since they're having uh, difficulty right now, they're at capacity in, in some respects. I think they, you know, it may be a challenge. And again, it's another place where it's difficult to double track it. Yeah, right. Those are uh, that gorge is, is not an easy place to uh, uh, to double track. Right. Thank you. Just a last question for Mr. Ganofsky. Uh, we've heard a lot about the um, Heartland Corridor project today. I certainly was pleased to play just a small role in, in moving that through the uh, Federal Highway uh, various processes uh, in recent years. But it, it, is Ashto, does Ashto have concerns that the, uh, what started out the old you know, highway bill became a highway transit bill, of course, and a highway transit pedestrian and highway transit pedestrian, CMAC, other, um, and I don't don't know how to describe how probably to describe. I don't have broad enough terms to describe what the bill turned into mm -hmm. a couple years ago with Safety Lou. But mm -hmm. is it uh, as we get ready as a country? And uh, certainly, you heard from Matt Rose, who's on the National Commission, talking about this issue uh, earlier today. But uh, what, what what happens if we end up having 10 or 20 or 30 Heartland Corridor type projects attached to to the same sort of uh, going after the same pot of money? That uh, historically was reserved for um, for highways and transit, uh, primarily funded out of the uh, over-the-road gas tax. Um, at what point do you start to start to sort of cannibalize the the, the multimodal system out there? I'm sure Ashto is I know Ashto is concerned with this issue, but any thoughts you could share with us? Personally, no. Uh, big subject, and, and and you know there's 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 competing interests galore for everything, and there's just less and less, and the needs are more and more. And, uh, you know, the challenges are daunting for all of us to be uh, 
able and wise enough as a country, if you will, to come together. And, and ASHTO tries to bring together all of those disciplines and to try to make sound recommendations as to what makes sense and what doesn't. But, um, you know, to get into any level of detail of how all that shakes out right now, I'm not, I'm not at all qualified to discuss. And I guess I don't want to speculate too much, but it's certainly within Congress's purview to say, hey, it's a transportation bill. Right. We're going to spend the money on uh, whatever we think is most important in the, in the general transportation world, regardless. And uh, it shouldn't really matter to folks who are paying the gas tax that, that they don't necessarily see the immediate, immediate benefits. They'll see some, presumably some tangential benefits. Well, we're, we're struggling. We're struggling all over. You know, we're struggling, uh, both ASHTO and Maryland Wise, uh, what to do with the motor carrier industry. They've got, uh, you know, they've got daunting challenges facing them as well uh, in getting around the Capitol Beltway and the Baltimore Beltway and all the points between. Uh, so we know those issues here real well. Mr. Chairman Buttrey, questions? Commissioner Moley? No, thank you. Thank you. That concludes this panel. We appreciate your time and participation today. And uh, with that, I'll call up the next panel um, from the city of Chicago, uh, Marcia Jimenez, and from the Regional Transportation District of Denver, Colorado, Charles A. Spitolnik. Can I take a minute? Welcome, Ms. Jimenez and Mr. Spatolnik. Uh, we appreciate your effort to be here from out of town, and uh, we look forward to your testimony. I believe we'll start with 